Thank you for joining us. I'm Brooks Rainwater, and I lead NLC's Center for City Solutions. I want to welcome everyone here to the City County Leadership Center in Washington. I'd also like to welcome all the people joining us on our Facebook live stream. And please, everyone join in on the conversation using the hashtag State of the Cities. Today we are releasing our annual State of the Cities report. This is the only national analysis of mayoral State of the City speeches, providing a window into the issues that city leaders care about most. In their State of the City addresses, mayors express their priorities for our cities, focusing on the economy and infrastructure, keeping community members safe, and investing in the future. This is the fourth annual State of the Cities report. When we began this project, the environment here in Washington, D.C. was very different. Now, while most of our eyes are glued to endless investigations and far-reaching budget cuts at the federal level, mayors are still hard at work solving the biggest issues facing our communities and our country. Local leadership is critical to move America forward. Today, as we release State of the Cities 2017, the federal government is creating challenges to city growth and innovation, and local leadership has never been more important. The President released his budget proposal yesterday, slashing programs like community development block grants, which are crucial to building strong communities. City leaders are the most trusted level of government, and their priorities shape the national political landscape. In cities, we find the solutions to our most pressing national challenges. You'll hear more about that from NLC Director of Research Christiana McFarland, who will share the report's results shortly. But first, let's hear about the state of America's cities from the mayors themselves. Cities and towns across America, the most sensitive and important issues actually play out on the ground, from police community relations to the development of our infrastructure. There is no pride in staying silent. There is no glory in allowing these things to happen, and there's certainly no courage in turning a blind eye to injustice. We need to ensure that the cooks who are making our meals at our favorite Long Beach restaurants and the workers who are caring for our seniors and the workers that are cleaning in our, our hotel rooms, that they continue to have the opportunity to be a part of our community and our city. As mayor, there is no issue I spend more time on because I believe that homelessness is the moral issue of our time. Our goal is to make our schools a part of the community centers of enrichment. Now here's where I call on the private sector. Don't get scared. If you apply yourself, college is going to be available to any resident of the city of Detroit who graduates from Detroit High School. It's one of the privileges of growing up in the city of Detroit. Well, that was exciting just to hear from our mayors from around the country and all of the great leadership that is happening at the ground level. Before I begin, just want to thank you all again for being here. Thank my <clears throat> colleagues and co-authors, uh, Brooks Rainwater, who you heard from, as well as Trevor Langan. Trevor, I think he's out there uh, handling the burritos, so make sure you get your fill this morning as well. Um, so for the po uh, past four years, NLC has been conducting this analysis of mayoral state of the city speeches. We're able to track mayoral priorities over time which, um, as Brooks was mentioning, there has been a lot of, a lot of change here in D.C., um, but really being able to dig down and see how are forces external to cities really impacting what is happening on the ground. We found, of course, when we dig into Mayor's State of the City speeches, that, of course, mayors are touting the fantastic, great qualities of their community, the achievements that their city has accomplished over the past year. Mayors are good for that, of course. I think we'll hear a little bit about that uh, during the panel. But I think what really struck us, one, was the really good dose of realism that we also heard from our mayors. They are realistic about the struggles and the challenges that their cities are facing regarding racial challenges, public safety, affordable, affordability issues. Above all, though, I think I was struck by their commitment to leveraging all that is great about their communities to the benefit of all the things that need to be improved. We saw this time and time again, for example, when mayors are calling together business leaders to create workforce development programs to help uh, returning citizens. We saw this uh, when um, in, in cities where, where mayors are extending transit to connect poorer communities to job centers. So we know that whether it's, uh, whether it's doing these programs, connecting communities, um, that mayors say it best in their own words, and I think we heard a little bit about that um, a few minutes ago. 
We're honored at National League of Cities to offer a glimpse into these speeches, into mayoral priorities. So we know that mayors are leading from the ground up, and that really is what gives power to their speeches and to, and to this analysis. In this analysis, we assess 120 mayoral state of the city speeches, and we identify when a mayor discusses a significant portion of their speech to a particular topic. And these are the issues that we, uh, that we identified in their speeches. This year, economic development, public safety, and infrastructure top the list of major issues most discussed by mayors. When looking historically, we find that the order and intensity of these 10 issues have remained relatively consistent. They generally fall into three tiers. The first tier are core functions that businesses and residents of cities come to expect their local governments to provide, including economic development and public safety. Second tier topics are very important, but also tend to be varied amongst cities depending on the city structure. And these include infrastructure, housing, um, uh, budget and finances, as well as education. So for example, not all uh, local governments control their schools. Lastly, third tier, to third tier topics tend to be issues that are critical, but are either still finding their way into regular city operations or are very much cross-cutting across city operations, including health, sustainability, demographics, and data and technology. Although we find that the prevalence of major issues has not changed much, the way that mayors are talking about these issues has changed and tends to shift. And how these issues play out locally is very distinctive by different types of cities. For example, what does it mean for the mayor of LA to talk about economic development versus the mayor of Syracuse? To better understand the local nuances of each major issue, we dig deeper to examine what we call subtopics, which are specific tools and strategies and issues related to these broader themes. We identify in the speeches if the mayors specifically discuss the subtopic as relevant to city operations and the city budget going forward. The majority of speeches indicated positive economic and fiscal growth, which I think is a really strong indicator in terms of the direction of our nation's cities. Within economic development, we found that job growth was the most talked about theme. Mayors laud the, the fruits of their uh, e economic attraction and business attraction efforts, but also noted the need to balance attraction with uh, retention and small business development efforts as well. And interestingly, mayors also highlighted the interconnectedness of these economic strategies. With, for example, with Peoria, Illinois, uh, the mayor focused on bolstering hometown innovation and entrepreneurship as part of a broader attraction strategy. So these are not siloed strategies. Despite signs of positive growth, mayors also acknowledge challenges related to affordability um, and the challenges of growth not reaching all in the community. Specifically in the context of improving economic equity and economic mobility, mayors spoke about the need to invest in residents through workforce development initiatives. For example, in Detroit, Mayor Mike Duggan announced an online platform to link job seekers to available jobs and relevant training programs to help ensure that they are eligible and prepared for those jobs. Downtown development was also discussed in the context of broader economic opportunity. The mayor of Troy, New York, for example, noted how recent residential and, commu uh, and commercial investment in the downtown has spurred not only and revived the heart of the downtown, but has been critical to restoring um, the surrounding neighborhoods and also returning pride to the city. Turning to public safety, acknowledging public safety as a first tier issue, Jersey City Mayor noted that building a safer neighborhood is the part of his job that he takes most seriously. Police and fire, which of course are the bread and butter of city services and also the largest portion of most city budgets, were the top public safety subtopics mentioned in mayoral speeches. Within public safety, mayors address the crime rate, both in terms of the crime rate is decreasing, but it's still a looming challenge. In response, 25% of mayors discussed officer recruitment and training, and we're finding with a return to healthier budgets that cities are getting back to staffing up their policing levels. Additionally, in Hartford, Connecticut, for example, Mayor Bronin also announced that thanks to the federal COPS program and grants, 
his city has been able to um, initiate a multi-year recruitment effort to hire officers that are more reflective of the diversity of his community. Additionally, acknowledging tenuous police community relations and racism, cities are also examining police training. For example, the mayor of Salt Lake City discussed, um, discussed her police training program that involved both de-escalation as well as implicit bias training uh, which is a program to help educate officers about subconscious stereotypes that they may hold about the public that they serve. More stable city finances are also leading to infrastructure improvements, and we're seeing this particularly in terms of aging roads, transit, and water infrastructure. For example, Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed is leveraging an improved bond rating to, back, to fill a backlog of maintenance projects and improve regional transit. In Columbia, South Carolina, the city has invested more than half a billion dollars in water and wastewater improvements, implemented a new sewer line rapid assessment tool, and also broke ground on a new LEED silver certified uh, distribution and wastewater management facility. All the exciting things that, that local governments invest their time in, very critical. Over a third of mayors dedicated some of their speech to public work, so this focuses on innovations in delivery of infrastructure-related services. In drought-prone Riverbank, California, the mayor announced the installation of, of smart water meters throughout the city. And, and this enables residents to track their water usage. And it also enables um, city, uh, city staff who had previously been reading meters to not have to do that and, and redirect their time and attention to critical maintenance and repairs. In addition to these major findings related to economic development, public safety, and infrastructure, we also find the differences in how these issues are playing out in cities of different sizes. For example, larger city mayors like Mayor Mike Duggan in Detroit are more likely to discuss affordability and economic inequality. Mayors in smaller cities like Wilmington, North Carolina focused more on quality of life issues like active transportation than their larger city counterparts. Quality of life issues were frequently mentioned in the context of attracting or keeping residents and attracting talent. As issues, um, an issue that united mayors in cities of all sizes, from Grand Rapids to San Diego, was their response to the negative political climate, with many talking about the po making positive statements about the importance of immigration and characterizing their community as a welcoming one. In a similar vein, we also noticed a renewed commitment of mayors to safeguarding the values of their constituency. From Mayor Ken Shutter in Burleson, Texas, noting, when someone attacks local control, what they are attacking is our ability to make choices about the direction of our own community. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, Mayor Denise Simmons, who said, her city is exploring legal and legislative member, uh, measures to be able to continue to adhere to the ideals that have made her city a national beacon of tolerance, diversity, inclusivity, and hope. These sentiments are precisely why this annual State of the Cities analysis is so important. To remind us that although our nation's cities have challenges, they are still the drivers of innovation, acceptance, and growth. Although cities are vastly different, one common factor is that mayors have emerged as the nation's leaders who are directly confronting and are most often motivated by reconciling all that is great and all that must be improved in our cities. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Rob Bull, General Manager of City Lab. Rob will lead our panel of city leaders as they reflect on these findings. I'd also like to welcome our panelists, uh, Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson, Mayor Bob Buckhorn, and my colleague Brooks Rainwater. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, as I said, my name is Robert Bull. I'm the Director and General Manager of City Lab, which is a publication of the Atlantic focusing on how cities thrive in the 21st century, uh, and how our lives will evolve in those. And so if you've not gone to City Lab, I would urge you to check it out at citylab.com. And if you are familiar with City Lab, 
uh, I would urge you to join one of our almost 50,000 people who receive our daily email newsletter about the future of cities. So, uh, but let's get to the task at hand. So on my immediate left is Mayor Karen Freeman Williams. She is the mayor of Gary, Indiana. Um, she is the 20th mayor of Gary. And uh, prior to becoming Gary, uh, the mayor, she was on the city council. Uh, she was the attorney general for the state of Indiana. Uh, and she's currently the second vice president of the National League of Cities. Uh, in her city address in February, the mayor discussed the importance of growing Gary's economy uh, and creating new job opportunities, which we're going to talk a lot about. But also, I have to compliment the mayor. It's a pleasure to be here on the stage with you because of the work you've done on the national drug courts and the work that you've done in, in general. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, Next to the mayor is Mayor uh, Bob Buckhorn, who is the 58th mayor of the city of Tampa. Uh, and he assumed office also in 2011. This is his second term. He's currently serving, uh, as I said, second term. He's uh, served two terms as the Tampa City Council. And, uh, and he focused on, a, if you haven't seen, by the way, the Tampa City of Tampa website, it is a lovely website. And the speech that the mayor gave has this beautiful vista behind it, so it's well worth taking a look at. Um, but he emphasized Tampa's strength in being inclusive and really building its economic diversity in terms of investment and technology and growth. Also, I have to compliment the, the mayor as well for bringing the Super Bowl back to Tampa in 2020, boxing out Los Angeles. It was a good day yesterday. Yes, it was. <laughs> Uh, we're all going to be very nice so that he invites us to come. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, also then to his left is uh, my friend Brooke Drainwater is the senior executive and director of the Center for City Solutions, who we've heard a little bit before. Um, and if you don't know, Brooks is really driving the research agenda, uh, the National City, uh, National League of Cities, and doing um, a wide variety of reports that are well worth reading and something that City Lab covers often and, and deeply, um, and is also the key in, in this report. So we're, I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, of the mayors and then have their, and, and of Brooks, and then have their feedback. And we'll also have time for you to ask some questions at the end. And if you don't ask questions, then I'm going to ask more questions. And so you just better come up with your own. Uh, so the first question is really about trust. And so since the early 70s, the Gallup organization has been measuring trust in government institutions, uh, uh, many public institutions. While it doesn't cover city institutions in particular, or mayors in particular, there's been an erosion in trust over time in, in institutions. Um, and I would suspect that that erosion in trust also reaches the mayoral offices, my, my sense, in general, in large measure. So first of all, do you agree uh, do you agree that there has been an erosion of trust in what mayors say and do? And then uh, what do mayors have to do in the current environment, which is a very divisive environment, to grow trust with their community? And what are you doing in particular? Mayor. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank NLC for the opportunity to join them. And I think this is <laughs> such a, a, an appropriate and, and important conversation right now. And I think you're absolutely right, Rob. Uh, trust has eroded in elected officials generally. Um, and But I would put one caveat, they trust mayors more. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the reality is that trust comes from knowing and being familiar with someone and having that person uh, really do what they say they're going to do. And if you look at the distrust that has um, heightened and increased in um, of public officials, it's because promises have been made and not kept. Mm. As mayors, I think we really hang our hats on being able to not only make promises, but keep them, and if we don't keep them, to explain why. And sometimes we have to do that in grocery stores. Sometimes we have to do that at the YWCA and in other places that we frequent across the community. And so people really get to understand and they hear from us, even in community forums, all of which I do on a weekly basis. The way that I really try to maintain trust in the city of Gary is to communicate 
with the residents of Gary on a regular basis. I answer my own emails. We have multiple community forums. Uh, I do. I go to water aerobics at the Y and very often in the locker room in, uh, you know, partially clothed <laughs> states. People will ask me about uh, dump sites or things that they need done around the city. And, you know, I say, well, I can't write it down right now, <laughs> but I will try to address it right away. Uh, enhancing police community trust has been an extremely important I want to get focus, to that next. Uh, yeah. of mayor. So I think it's really the fact that they have more of an opportunity to know us, to uh, understand us, to communicate with us in the communities, and then that really does enhance trust. You know, if I had known it was Crazy Sock Day, I would have worn something yeah, entirely yeah. different. Uh, <laughs> I would have thoroughly embarrassed my 16-year-old daughter when busted out a pair of socks like these two guys have. Uh, Slacker. Slacker, yeah, that's right. Um, I would agree. I think the relationship between the community and its mayor is very different than most elected officials. It's far more intimate. I, I can't tell you that I have answered questions with nothing but a towel on, but um, I'm sure that there that day will come. Um, <laughs> But I think that's a good thing, and I think we're going to hear later on down the road in this panel about um, the attack on local governance mm -hmm. at both the federal and the state levels. Um, but I think people understand that mayors are a different breed of cat. I mean, we are far more pragmatic, far less political, far less partisan, far more focused on the metrics and delivering on the product that we say we're going to do. Uh, we are available. And we're hands-on. I mean, we don't get the luxury of kicking the can down the road financially. We have to balance our budgets every year. You know, we hire and fire. And in the case of the city of Tampa, I'm the CEO of 4,400 employees. I mean, we're running a major corporation here in essence. And so there's got to be accountability to the shareholders. Uh, they have to have a return on their investment, which is their tax dollars. If they hit that pothole, they're not calling the president of the United States. They're calling us. And so they expect us to deliver on what we say we're going to do. And I think for the most part, uh, mayors are far more accountable. Um, they recognize that relationship. They build on it. And that's why you're seeing mayors emerge as the thought leaders around the country and the metropolitan areas becoming the engines of opportunity. And I would submit to you that if you mess with that, you're killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, but mayors, I think, and I think uh, this mayor would agree, we have the best job in American politics because we have the ability to shape our cities. We have a, the ability to leave a legacy for that next generation. We will leave this office at some point and be able to walk down that street 10 years from now and said, say to ourselves, I had a part in this and I had a part in this and this city's a better place because of my time here. That's a different relationship. And unfortunately, um, mayors don't run the world, but they really should. <laughs> I think um, both of the mayors captured this incredibly well. And really, it comes back to this idea of in cities, it's where the rubber really meets the road. You know, as you said, mayors are who we call when a pothole isn't fixed. Um, all of our research bears this out. And public polling bears this out over time, too, that you consistently see uh, more support for mayors and local officials than you do state level leaders as well as federal le leaders. And I think it's because they are our friends and neighbors. We see them in the supermarket. We know that uh, they have to be responsive to wants and needs, and they are. I mean, as, as you mentioned, as we see things happening at the state and federal level, it's mayors that are trying to pass minimum wage laws. It's mayors trying to pass paid leave laws and support community members in many different ways. And so I think that's really where it comes back to. And by the way, I believe, Mayor Buckhorn, you could borrow uh, Mayor Freeman Wilson's uh, undercover boss costume if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this year has been marked by headlines about communities that have been protesting the police and the and engagement with the police. Uh, this has turned, sparked really important conversations about transparency and equity in policing. At the same time, I go back to the, the Gallup poll, which has shown over time that actually trust in police by the broader community has remained high, even as the crime rates around the country in, in many of the cities uh, have gone down. So I want to ask you a sort of a, a, a two-part question, one about the past and one about the future. So as urban leaders, when you look back 
at the last 10 years, last decade of work. Obviously, that the, this moment in time has been building t towards this conversation uh, over the last decade. What would you have done differently, or what would you have wished that your cities or urban mayors in general have done differently to engage with audiences and uh, communities in ways that would have alleviated the problem? And then also, can you then switch to the future and tell me a little bit of how you connect your equity agenda with policing and public safety in your communities? H hugely important issue in our cities. Um, I have the, the luxury of having been around City Hall since 1987. I was the young assistant to the mayor at the time. And Tampa lived through its racial disturbances in the late 80s and early 90s. I mean, I was out there in the middle of the rocks and the bottles and the dumpsters burning and things very similar to what you saw in Baltimore um, occurred in my city for a lot of the same reasons. We had a police department at the time that was um, – staffed by some folks who were not as progressive as we would have preferred. Uh, we had a number of incidents where young black men died in police custody, uh, largely at the hands of white police officers. So the very same things that we saw over the last three, four years occurred in my city in the early, um, early late 80s. And we decided at the time that we were never going to let that happen in our city again. And so we set off on a journey. And, and understand this, you don't fix this problem uh, with a human relations seminar. This is an ongoing discussion that takes place on every call, in every interaction between the police and the community. It takes place in how you hire and discipline police officers, making sure that your department reflects the, the diversity of your community. It goes to training. And so literally every day since 1987, 1988, we worked on that community relationship. Now, is it perfect? Not by a long stretch. Do I think we are in far better shape than most communities because of that? Absolutely, I do. But I will tell you that it is a work in progress. It will always be a work in progress. And that interaction between those that serve and protect and the community is one of the most challenging issues that we face as a country and certainly as um, America's cities on any given stop. And I sleep at night with the police radio on. On any given stop, in any given city, the potential exists for something combustible to happen. I mean, it, it is the reality of the world in which we live. It is the availability of guns on the street. It is the, 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 the officer's fear of coming across someone who's going to use that gun on them. It's the fear of our minority communities because of incidents that have occurred, and rightfully so. Um, it is a tenuous, combustible environment out there that we have to recognize and that we have to deal with every day. And progressive cities and progressive mayors that acknowledge it, you know, you can't keep your head in the sand. It is real. But you acknowledge it and you try to move forward and you build those bridges. And at the end of the day, you don't have a perfect city, uh, but you are moving towards um, that relationship and strengthening that on a daily basis. I certainly agree with Mayor Buckhorn. You asked also how we got here. Mm. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, there's been this um, discussion about community-oriented policing. For a long time, that was synonymous with simply increasing the number of police in a community. That's very different from the concept and the way of doing business that is consistent with community-oriented policing, which is very much about the community, getting to know the community, making sure police are a part of the community during times when there isn't a crisis. And so because you were increasing the number of police and communities across the country before, and it was a good thing, but while the number was being increased, the relationship was not being uh, enhanced. And so you just had police in the community. And, and then there was a different standard. Um, you know, it was thought that if you were a military police officer, you would be a great uh, police officer in a city. That's simply not always the case. 
because there are similar, some similar tendencies or characteristics, I should say. But in in most parts, you know, there's a need to really want to serve the community, mm -hmm. not just protect, which is important in both instances, but also being a, a public servant is extremely important. And so we're understanding that more. Mm -hmm. We're understanding the importance of hiring and of recruitment and of really making sure that there is back to the earlier discussion of of a relationship and creating a trusting relationship between the police and the community because if i trust you then i will give you the benefit of the doubt if there is a sh police shooting but if i don't trust you then i immediately will default to a situation where there was something bad that happened. Obviously, something bad happened if someone is shot, but there was something uh, nefarious mm. in the uh, role of the police officer, and that simply cannot be the case. But what we do know is that communities across the uh, globe, uh, across the U.S., certainly want the police there. We need the police. We want to be safe. We want to feel safe. At the same time, we think that it's our role to ensure that there is a relationship that will allow trust to grow and allow the community and police to work together. The last thing I'd say, it's not simply the job and role of police officers to ensure their safety in our communities. And if communities understand that there are, uh, are multiple roles that we can play, then that takes the pressure off police officers. Do you, to, before I go to Brooks, I want to hear about the national perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you think, for the, for the mayors, do you think that there's a changing role of the relationship between the mayor and the police department? In many ways that I've always observed, it was sort of the city, the mayor, and the police as three separate engagements. And really, the police work for mayors in most most cities. Do you, do you feel you're having, personally, a different uh, relationship with your police chiefs and the police in general than over time? Or is it, uh, and do you see that uh, happening across the country? I think there has to be. And in fact, um, well, you know, I'm a little different as a mayor because I practiced cr criminal defense law. I was a prosecutor, you know, I was AG. And so I dealt with police and interacted with police officers all my life. Yeah. But I've seen my colleagues be interact much more with their police chiefs, particularly in the last five years. Now, there were mayors who have always done that, but I think we're beginning to understand the important role that police chiefs play in um, in our community. Not just public safety, but economic development, the in, whole thing. In all aspects. Yeah. And police chiefs are being brought in to the community in a much broader sense to play those roles. And so who serves in that position is extremely important. You know, as in essence, the CEO, that police department has to reflect your values. And that police chief has to re reflect your values. I mean, I, I'm a big supporter of our police department. We used to ride with them all the time. I still back them up in the middle of the night when I hear they need backup on the radio. Um, I've always been in fear of that big black suburban rolling up behind them and one of these guys tases me because he thinks I'm a bad guy. Um, <laughs> but it's really, really important that whoever you hire is the police chief, and in the city of Tampa, the police chief works for the mayor, <laughs> that that person really understand um, how important it is that they reflect your DNA and that what the issues that you care about and your willingness to go out um, and be engaged in the community and be visible in the community and talk to the community has to start at the top and then it will filter through the entire agency if you have that culture that's established by the mayor that's executed by the police chief and that will filter through your entire department in our department our, our motto is that we treat everybody with respect it doesn't matter if you're a homeless person or you're the mayor every encounter is a reflection on all of us. Um, so it's, yeah, it is really important. I mean, we, you can't have a rogue police chief that is not on the same page um, as a mayor because that's just an invitation for some really bad things to happen. 
Brooks. Just add that consistently we see public safety as a top three issue within our state of the city's research. So over the four years, it tends to be right around number two. And within that, community policing has been the critical area that mayors are focused on in these last few years. And we've also seen a, a kind of an uptick in transparency and thinking about body cameras and making investments in body cameras. And so within this whole idea of investments, it's really around training and technology. And so I think that's kind of the direction that many mayors are going in when they're thinking about how to spend more money rather than just simply hiring more police. And uh, the word holistic continues to come up because a lot of this has to really kind of come together in different ways, that the mayor has to work together with the police chief, the police chief has to work together with the cops on the beat and make sure that they are um, working together with the community members too. So I want to switch topics a little bit and touch upon the question of preemption. So there is a lot of talk of late of how cities uh, are operating alone in a policy environment um, uh, from their states as well as from the federal government. But however, cities sit in regions. And there are really important ties, economic, market, cultural ties, infrastructure ties between cities and regions. I'd be interested, if you want to talk about preemption, I, I would love to hear it. But I'd also love to hear about what you're doing or what you have seen other mayors do that build those ties in region, both from a practical operational point of view, but also from a political strength point of view. Um, so how is, how is the region of Gary, Indiana, and what have you done to connect with your counterparts? So our region is Northwest Indiana, and um, we have been able to connect um, both from a, um, a structural capacity and also uh, informally. We have the region, regional development authority. So that economic uh, connection exists. It existed prior to my getting into office, but it allows us to sort of build our economic development health heft. Uh, it allows us to increase the ability to engage and invest in large projects. For us, mm -hmm. it was a $25 million investment in a, um, in a national park that was also a city park, and it allowed us to really increase economic development in the area. But it also uh, has increased our uh, thinking and our ability to grow our region as we invest in rail, commuter rail, that uh, makes it easier and decreases our ability to transport or allow people to, uh, trans, um, to commute from <laughs> Chicago, from uh, the metropolitan area of Chicago. So it's going to be a 35-minute commute to downtown Chicago from Gary, Indiana. That's a big opportunity for us to increase the number of citizens who live in our community. However, preemption does exist. And, you know, from our perspective, you could focus on preemption and all of the things that uh, are opportunities for local control that the state of Indiana takes away from us, and, and they are many, it's a long list. Or you could focus on the opportunity to really cooperate uh, from a regional perspective, uh, like with commuter transit, like with economic development, and the other areas where we've chosen to do. It doesn't mean that you ignore it or stop fighting. One of the major issues for us is their preemption, preemption of a handgun lawsuit that we engaged in. But it means that you also look for opportunities to cooperate and work together. Um, don't get me started on preemption. Wow. I need some news here. So, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> let's go. I'm capable of making it. Uh, <laughs> let me start with the regional cooperation first. How many of you actually think there's a city named Tampa Bay? It's not. The fish live in Tampa Bay. <laughs> there is no city of Tampa Bay, but yet because of the regional cooperation that we have with the city of St. Petersburg, and because all of our sports teams are named Tampa Bay such and such, that a large portion of the world thinks that there is actually a city um, called Tampa Bay. We recognized, and the mayor of St. Petersburg, a fellow named Rick Kreisman, has been my friend for 25 years, and this wasn't always the case. Tampa and St. Pete always competed against each other. We were very parochial towards each other. We have bridges that divide us <coughs> as they cross the bay. 
Um, but Rick and I, who were elected about the same time, their, their city is probably 200,000 and we're, you know, 350. Um, we decided that we weren't going to engage in that behavior, that we were stronger together, that we competed globally as a region together. Uh, he and I have traveled abroad on economic development missions together to sell the assets of our respective communities. I benefit when he succeeds. He benefits when I succeed. If he gets a corporate relocation, half of the CEOs and C-level executives are going to be living on the Tampa side. We all will grow together as a region because we're, if you think about the macro economics, it's not individual cities, with the exception of New York and Chicago and L.A. It's regions that are competing around the globe. Those are the economic engines that are driving the world's economy. So I'm not interested in competing with St. Petersburg, certainly. I'm not even interested in competing with Miami or Orlando or Alabama. I'm interested in competing with region states around the globe. And when we join together and we link our futures together, we are so much more competitive, so much more diverse. They have things that we don't have. We have strengths that they don't have. But together, we're going to be a much better region. Those bridges have become conduits to cooperation as opposed to barriers, which historically they had always been. So for me, regionalism is uh, the wave of the future and the way it should be. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about preemption as a separate topic. Um, but I will tell you this, I have mm -hmm. never seen such an assault on local government as what we were experiencing over the last two to three years. It is orchestrated. It is driven by an agenda uh, that would uh, gather all of that power, particularly in states that are controlled by one party from top to bottom. It's a cut and paste agenda that is being implemented all across the country. Um, it goes right to the heart of local control. Um, articulated by a party that historically has said local control is the, the, the most conservative and most effective form of government. But yet because cities and mayors care about their LGBT friends, because we welcome immigrants to our communities, because we want to do something about gun violence, somehow they want to take that authority from us and they think they can do it better at the federal level or at the state level. It's wrong. If you kill the economic engines that create the ecosystem that allow this country to pull itself out of this recession and move it forward, those are the cities. And when you cut our throats, you're cutting the country's throat. And so my message to all of them is leave us the hell alone. Get out of our business. <laughs> Can't wait to read that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, Everybody, go. <laughs> leave cities alone. All right, I cleaned it up. Um, let us do our job because I tell you what, we do it better than they do it up here, and we do it better certainly than they do it in state capitals. Let me follow up with that with asking, um, again, I want to get back to the larger region, but let me follow back to the, to the mayors just for a second. Yeah. What are the most effective strategies that you would – propose cities to follow to uh, fight against preemption? What are the strategies and tactics that you think are going to be winning in 2017, 2018, and onward? Um, without being partisan about this, um, in some states, mine in particular, the Democrats have to be more competitive. Uh, we, we are not currently. The, the, the state of Florida is entirely controlled. Um, by the Republican Party and what has happened. And the Democrats were guilty of this 20 years ago when we controlled everything. When one party controls everything, they overreach. Mm -hmm. They've already done the normally crazy stuff. Now they're doing the really, really crazy stuff. Um, open carry. You know, who thinks it's a good idea that you can walk around with your guns hanging out? I mean, what do you think that's going to do to tourism at Disney? Mm -hmm. For all the Europeans who can't even buy guns to come over to the state of Florida and see people walk around openly carrying uh, their weapons? You know, if I do anything about gun violence, if I pass any gun legislation, the Florida legislature passed a law at the request of the NRA, I can be sued personally as the mayor, personally. So I think elections matter. And if you want to stop this movement, uh, the Democrats have to be more competitive in my state. Um, because if you at least can win a governor's race, you can stop bad things from happening and veto bad bills. Um, but I think we need to make the case to the voters, and I'll give you a classic example. They just passed in the state of Florida in the legislature this year a referendum that will add another $25,000 on what's called the homestead exemption. 
So that's $25,000 on top of what is already a $50,000 homestead exemption off of the value of your house that you don't have to pay taxes on. They put, they're going to put it on the ballot. And they're going to run home and say, we cut taxes. It will probably pass. That's a $6 million hit to me right off the bottom line. You know, they take credit for it, but they're not the ones providing the service that that $6 million would have paid for. So as mayors, we are faced with a simple fundamental choice. Do we reduce our level of services? Do we cut cops and firefighters? Or do we raise the millage rate? Mm -hmm. Also, they can put in their direct mail pieces that they cut taxes. I mean, it's wrong. It is inherently wrong when we are the ones that are actually providing the services and driving the economy that's pulling Florida out of the recession. Amen? Amen. Right. <laughs> I, I think it's important that we communicate to voters. Um, the mayor is absolutely right. But we have to communicate in a way for them to understand how does this impact you. Uh, we had a similar measure about 10 years ago where our property taxes were capped by the state government. And so, you know, I voted for that. Of course, I wasn't the mayor at the time. It was a great idea. <laughs> but you have to explain to people that if you think that's a good idea, if you vote for it, if you support that referendum, this is going to mean that your services are reduced. And you have to make it very clear. That means that the vacant lot next to you might not get cut. That means that it might take police longer to get to your house if you call them. It means that firefighters may not be readily available for EMS services or for traditional fire services. Are you willing to accept that for paying a, a little less on your tax bill? And if the answer is yes, then by all means support it. But we have to communicate directly in a sense to our voters, to our residents, to citizens, what it really means when these state laws preempt local control. Because if you communicate it in a way that helps folks understand, then nobody's going to vote for uh, a measure or support a measure that allows folks to openly carry guns around Disney or quite frankly anywhere else. But you know, it happens in many instances in a remote place. For us it's Indianapolis. For Florida it's Tallahassee. You know, you may not get the news there. And as a result of that, people really don't know what's going on. I think we can communicate because we're in, in cities and communities across the world, and our council counterparts <laughs> can communicate what's happening in these state capitals that is really impacting our everyday lives. So Brooks, how are mayors communicating these questions from the State of the City speech and, and about regionalism and about preemption? You know, I think what we're finding on preemption in particular is that mayors are using the bully pulpit that they have to, to kind of bring knowledge about what's actually happening in cities. Because most people don't realize that they're being preempted on direct taxation from municipal broadband, uh, from minimum wage, from paid leave. I mean, the list goes on and on of what states are telling cities and mayors that they can't do, rather than lifting up the innovation that's kind of percolating upwards from cities. And so that's what we consistently see and hear, is that it, it's the storytelling piece, trying to figure out how we can tell that story better, as well as think about different legal strategies. We've seen legal strategies that have won in a number of states, where these cases go up to the state Supreme Court and other places. And so I think trying to figure out what the suite of tools is that mayors have as well as uh, what's available statewide. And I do think that regionalism is actually a tool that could be used more and more with preemption fights because the more that we can get communities together of different political um, backgrounds and ideology, the more that we can make that consistent message c get forward, which is local control helps everyone. So we're going to enter. So we're going to open it up for questions in just a moment. But I'm going to enter the the tweetable round. Um, Thought I just did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah your exception. Uh, so very quickly, though, you know, I, I've often found talking to mayors and chiefs of staff that they're often looking at issues that are six to ten months out in the sense of when it will be news. Like mayors understand the future more than almost anyone else. Um, and that when publications like mine uh, 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 print something, it's generally been uh, discussed and, and thought about in the, in the mayor's office for, for a, uh, quite a time. So I'm going to ask you to 
tell the future in the shortest bit of time. When we think about the financial and fiscal situations of cities, what are the things that are going to happen in the future for cities? What are the things that most concern you or the issues that you're facing that are not today, but you know, in 2018? Um, financially, I would submit to you that most cities are not quite out of the woods yet. Um, in spite of the fact that the recession is winding down, um, I mean, just by way of example, the budget that was submitted in the city of Tampa, property tax revenues in 2007 was $162 million. The budget that I just submitted this past fall to city council was only $150 million. So we are still not back to 2007 in revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So for us, um, you know, that financial situation is still pretty precarious. Um, I don't know that that's going to change much moving forward, and obviously whatever happens here in Washington, D.C. in particular in terms of the president's budget and some of the tools that historically have been available to us is going to have a big impact. I mean, if you start talking about eliminating CDBG and fast starts and choice neighborhoods, um, it's going to be really problematic for us. It's, it, we're the ones that will feel and bear the brunt of that. Uh, so I don't know that there's a, a crystal ball, I think, for most of us mayors. Um, we're trying to just keep our heads down and move forward, uh, recognizing that, you know, we are in tenuous times and nothing is proven to be predictable as of late. Uh, so we really don't know from infrastructure uh, to municipal, uh, you know, debt what's going to happen. So we just get up every day like the rest of you, turn the news on, um, never cease to be amazed, and we go to work. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what's coming. I really don't. And that uncertainty is, is troubling for those of us that have to do this every day um, and manage budgets and manage people. Um, I wish there was some clarity. Whatever that clarity might be, you know, I can live with whatever the answer is. But give us some clarity. Give us a path. Tell us how it's going to affect us. And we as mayors, being the adaptive folks that we are, will figure out a way how to make uh, lemonade out of lemons. You know, as, as um, states and certainly the federal government have um, decided that they're going to give cities an opportunity to be more involved in, in certain areas. You have seen most of us or many of us run around saying that the sky is falling. Well, that's not a false prophecy. That's the reality for many of us who are not out of the woods and for some of us like the city of Gary who has not even who have not even found a path out of the woods so to say that we're going to cut CDBG to say that we're going to uh, cut the budget of the EPA by 25 cents to say that we're going to cut significant and proven programs in the Department of Justice really places a burden on cities that may cause many of our counterparts to go into bankruptcy or to find themselves on the verge of bankruptcy. And that's not just um, hyperbole. That's reality because so many of our communities depend so heavily on those programs and the, the tragedy of it is that we depend on the programs, one, for innovation. When you think about the um, program out of the Department of Transportation that has allowed uh, cities to really get involved in uh, high, high speed rail or uh, transit and other innovative programs, but we also depend on those programs to protect our most vulnerable citizens, mm -hmm. uh, the homeless population, uh, people who heavily depend on head, head Start and other programs. And to say that you are going to cut both the Tiger Grant program and uh, Head Start and and uh, the other programs that serve our seniors and most vulnerable citizens means that you're not just engaged in an assault on cities. You're engaged in an assault on people. Thank you. And that's unacceptable. So um, I'd like to do it to the audience, give the audience the opportunity to have, ask any questions. If you could, uh, I guess there is maybe a mic or just shout out and give us an affiliation that would be helpful. 
right there. Yeah, I'm, I'm Greg Squires at George Washington University, and I have a question about economic development subsidies. There's, as, as I think most of you know, there's a new data set that's coming <coughs> online this year that will allow the general public to identify how much every city is losing from the tax abatements that it's providing in the name of economic development. And I'm wondering if, if this is a tool that you think will be useful for cities, and more importantly, what can cities do to ensure greater accountability in economic development subsidies so that when a tax break is given, we know that it's going for a project that wouldn't otherwise occur in the absence of that tax break, and to make sure that the jobs are created or the affordable housing units are built or whatever, whatever's supposed to be done with that subsidy actually gets done. Great question. Yeah, great question. And certainly, um, it, as you look across that same agenda that's being implemented in, in states that I referenced earlier, uh, there is a thought, and it's occurring in my state, uh, in the form of the Speaker of the House, that any type of subsidies um, is nothing more than corporate welfare. Yeah. I mean, that is his rhetoric, not mine. The same would be true for marketing of uh, Visit Florida. I mean, of any state that has engaged in the marketing of itself, it's been Florida, historically. Um, I will tell you, as a practitioner, and as somebody who was just yesterday meeting with site selectors, that are the folks that bring these deals to your community and pitching Tampa as a place that they want to be. Um, subsidies are not the be in all and the end all, but they are a part of the tool package. And I would agree with you that there needs to be transparency in that process. We don't do as many property tax abatements as we do um, what we, we call them uh, QTIs, which are incentives for job creation. I agree that there should be transparency. I agree in some cases that there have been jobs that were promised that were not created. But in every deal that we do, there are clawback provisions in that arrangement. So if the job is not created, the money is not given. This, we don't do a blank check to a company just because you know they blink their eyes at us and flirt with us. Um, <laughs> if they don't create the jobs, they don't get the incentive package. If you unilaterally disarm as a state, I promise you that your competitors are not. If we cut funding for Visit Florida, which this legislature did, California's going to ramp up, Colorado's going <coughs> to ramp up, all of our competitors are going to ramp up, and every tourist that comes to our state uh, represents um, an opportunity for jobs in the tourism industry. In, in the state of Florida, that's tens of thousands of jobs. In my city, um, bringing those corporations to us, even if we had to incentivize them, means that people are being hired, that means cars are being bought, that means houses are being bought, that means taxes are being paid. I think there is a role for incentives in this effort, but I do agree that transparency is important. And that data would be helpful. That data would be extremely helpful, and it's something um, that we already engage in in terms of the analysis, but it would save us money, quite frankly, because whenever there's a proposal or a discussion with a company, we have to pay to um, have that analysis done. And for a city like ours, that's expensive. But I think that it not only would be helpful to um, know to ensure compliance with those um, breaks that are given. But I think it's also important to get us to think uh, more critically as a region. Just yesterday I had a conversation with a company that uh, came to us and essentially said, we have been in discussions with a neighboring community. What can you do that will uh, entice us to come to our um, to to your community, and I will be honest. My first inclination was to say, "Okay, let's get our pencils out and think about what we can do to entice them to come to Gary as opposed to our neighbor." And then this morning, I wake woke up with an epiphany to say, "Number one, that doesn't help." our Northwest Indiana region. And number two, um, when I first engaged this company, it was with the understanding that they had made a decision not to go to that community. They're simply using us as a ploy to um, essentially turn the screws in our neighbor. 
that doesn't help the taxpayers of that community. So my email this afternoon to them will be, we're sorry. <laughs> we're not going to be a part of that game. And I don't even know that were the shoe on the other foot, the other community would have done the same thing. But I think as a regional thinker, as someone who understands that it doesn't help the taxpayers of a neighboring community, I have the responsibility to make that decision. I hope make what was the name of that company? company? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not telling you. Just whisper it. No one will hear I do think this gets at the more that mayors can cooperate with one another and cities can cooperate with one another. They can get the better deal rather than businesses because I think the more transparency we have around this, uh, the better that within states as well as among states, uh, city leaders are really able to say this is what is happening and we don't need to be spending this much for jobs that don't materialize. So making sure you have the clawback provisions, making sure we're thinking about how to build up um, members of the community that already live there rather than bringing new new folks in from outside. These are things that we've got to do to build you know, equity in our community. The other part of that equation is certainly in our case, we only subsidize um, those industries that we've identified Tampa has a competitive advantage in and that's going to create the value added jobs that we want. I mean, we're not interested in call center jobs. We're not interested in funding jobs that for folks that work at McDonald's. I mean, with all due respect, um, it's going to be the value added jobs. It's going to be the high tech jobs. Those are the ones that we are willing to engage in that discussion. And, and uh, you know, if we have to buy a little love, we buy some love. Well, Madam Mayor, I would actually, and we go to this question saying, I would, I would think that maybe this is an opportunity for you to open a dialogue with your fellow mayor and think about a regional approach. But I also would point people to a particular study that I like that the Economic Innovation Group does really about the lack of dynamism in economies and the lack of building up your own infrastructure, your own entrepreneurs, and that the, the, the notion of um, there are only a few places that really have a dynamic economy and part of the goal is to really try to build that up naturally in your community as much as you possibly can. But we have another, another question here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jay Dick. I'm with Americans for the Arts. And I was surprised uh, but pleasantly uh, pleased to see that the arts were a major subtopic of economic development. Could you talk to me about how the arts and culture, actually that's separate than tourism, those are actually two separate things, um, help contribute to your plans for your, your city, with, uh, especially around economic development? Sure. Hugely important. Uh, at one point we did a study that determined that the arts in Tampa generated more income to the local economy than sports. You know, and we're a big sports town. Um, so for us, particularly in this in the city bu building business, um, arts have got to be a huge component of it. Whether it's the cultural arts, the visual arts, whether it's the public art that you encounter as you're walking down the street, um, we have clustered most of our arts facilities in our downtown core, largely around the waterfront, um, and they're huge drivers of traffic um, into our town, uh, pedestrian traffic as well as as uh, vehicular traffic. They are very, very popular. Uh, St. Pete has a, its own great vibe with the Dali and some of the other things uh, over there that complement what we do, and we try and package the Bay Area as a cultural arts experience. Uh, part of that is uh, taking advantage of the history of your community. I mean, Tampa has a long storied history of, of immigrants who came here and taking advantage of that and highlighting it and celebrating it and creating opportunities around it. Uh, we take great pride in that and are very aggressive about it. It is, and a significant portion of what makes a great city is the arts and incorporating the arts into uh, your city building efforts. Google Art, art House Gary. Um, that is um, the most recent art economic development project that we did with the um, help of both Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Knight Foundation. And it's interesting because it's a public art project that the Ber Bloomberg Group would have been very happy for us to just construct the public art using the $1 million and, and let that be the end of it. We can't afford to make those types of decisions in Gary, even with grant money. And so we thought about how we might rethink an existing space as a public art space and utilize it uh, to the benefit of residents for something that we needed. That's where our culinary business incubator was born. And so now we're incubating 
food related businesses, mm -hmm. uh, those who want to start restaurants, we're providing a path for them to start restaurants in a community that certainly doesn't have the number of restaurants that we need. And as a result of that, not only are we engaging in uh, an economic development that's art related, but we're also expanding our economy through small businesses mm. because we understand the importance of small businesses to growing our community. And, and uh, we've done that also in our lakefront community with the Miller Beach Arts and Creative District. In fact, they started that uh, movement in the city of Gary, and we've just uh, latched on to it and <coughs> continued it. Said so that arts and culture drive economic development in cities, and it's something we've seen consistently in state of the cities. And it's something that I think inherently we all feel when we go to any city. You know, we think about the museums in that place. We think about the place making that we see all around us. I mean, when you think of Washington D.C., you think of the Smithsonian. You think of everything on the National Mall. And so that drives tourism and everybody coming to the city, but it also creates that sense of place that we all feel within our own communities. So one of the principal rules of any Washington, D.C. gathering is ending on time, because people are <laughs> pressed. So we have one more question. I'd ask the panel to go sort of a lightning round on the question. Please. Glad to be the lightning round. Ethan Handelman from the National Housing Conference. Uh, I'm pleased to see that housing is a major issue in the report, the full spectrum from homelessness to home ownership. Can you talk about your plans, especially in light of proposed federal cuts in home, CDBG, Section 8, you name it, all the tools you rely on? Yeah, everything that goes to the heart of what we attempt to do for our community is just embodied in your question. Um, we're going to have to continue to do more with less, whether it's on the homeless front and the housing first efforts that a lot of us have been engaged in, uh, to workforce housing. I mean, historically, you know, we have allowed a mentality that you, you, uh, you know, the, the, the workers in your cities that propel your cities and drive your cities are forced to live 50 miles outside your city because that's the only place they can qualify. You know, they, they drive until they can qualify to buy something. That's not going to work. Uh, transit is a big part of that. And, uh, you know, Tampa has struggled with creating a multimodal transit system for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but if we're going to thrive as a city, we've got to have um, affordable workforce housing in close proximity to the jobs that are being created. We've got to deal with the issue of homelessness from a housing first perspective. Um, and then the normal types of in infill that we do in our communities, um, all of which will be made more challenging if the current budget proposal moves forward. Candidly, I don't know how we would replace CDBG dollars, how would we, we would replace housing dollars. The market can only do so much. Um, in terms of providing these housing options, so it's um, moving forward for mayors. It's going to be a big. It's going to be a big hurdle to overcome if they implement what we've been reading about. I think that we have uh, two opportunities, and uh, for us in the city of Gary, we've had a robust partnership with our state in terms of create creating housing at every level. Uh, of affordability from housing for homeless uh, veterans to uh, housing that uh, makes a new college graduate or a young family a bit um, able to afford housing. But at the same time, we revisited a program that occurred maybe 30 years ago out of HUD, the Dollar House program with Gary. We have a large vacant and abandoned housing problem. But all of those vacant and abandoned houses do not need to be demolished or deconstructed. And so we began a pilot to look at how do we get those housing houses back on the tax roll into the economy, and we've seen success there. I think this is an opportunity to, to expand that. But I think the bottom line is that we really have to show uh, members of Congress, because the budget is just a proposal, how important CDBG is to the people in our communities. You know, what happens if that goes away? What programs won't occur? Whether it's Meals on Wheels, whether it's the home funding that's used to support housing in our communities. And that's our job, to lead that charge, because we really cannot afford to lose that uh, program. 
Last word. So housing is key for cities large and small. And what I would say, right now we need to be building stronger relationships with the state and federal government. And instead, what we're seeing coming um, from these proposed budget cuts just doesn't do what we need. And so to all of us, I'd say let's stop the cuts. Mm. Well, thank you very much to our panel. This has been a thoroughly interesting and, and fun discussion, to be quite honest. Um, I want to thank, you know, Brooke Drainwater and hosting us at National League of Cities, Mayor Bob Buckhorn and Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson, and also to the audience and to you online. Thank you for your questions and interests, and let's go forth and continue to make cities great. Cheers. Thank you.